Hey, beautiful friend. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. Grace means that all your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. It's a pretty powerful quote. And I don't know who said it originally, but it's a quote that I have as um, like the head of one of my chapters in my book. And you've all heard the phrase, you grow through what you go through. And this is certainly true. And today's guest is going to share her journey, her story of overcoming shame. She's going to focus on her healing journey and how she is now using that journey to follow God's calling, his purpose for her to help other women overcome shame. A primary focus of post-abortion, but every single thing that she wrote in her book, Unveiled Freedom, applies to any person, any woman who has experienced shame related to absolutely anything in their life. This is not a political conversation. I want to emphasize that. This is a journey of faith and discovery. However, if the topic of abortion is an emotional trigger for you, please feel free to hit pause and just move on to the next episode because the last thing we want to do is upset you. We're here today to show you how God is so abundantly grace, gracious to us. And when we believe, when we trust, that shame can just slot the way and we can heal. Without further ado, LaToya Matthews, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you so much for having me, Robin. I'm so excited to be here. Well, it is an honor to see you yes. kind kind yes. of face-to-face, -face, right? Virtually face-to-face. -face. We have been following each other on Instagram for years, and it was so fun to read your book because there were so many times you, you mentioned things in the book about your journey, and I'm like, oh, I remember saying that on Instagram. <laughs> And like little videos or things like that, that just reminded me of you and your beautiful, just graceful presence that you have. And so I'm honored that you took time today to, to be with me here and that you sent me the book and shared your story with me because it is truly inspiring. And listeners, I'm going to ask LaToya to introduce herself, um, tell us a little bit about her journey, and then we are going to have just a conversation. I asked the Holy Spirit this morning. I said, please just guide us and let this conversation be powerful and meaningful to the person that needs to hear this message today. If that is you, let us know. Reach out to LaToya, reach out to me, and we are happy to just smother you in love and grace, no matter what your journey with shame has been. All right, LaToya, tell us a little bit about your yeah. journey. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Robin, for having me. It is an honor to be on this amazing podcast. So I just do want to say thank you um, so much for having me, because like you said, we've been following each other for years. And so I'm just, you know, so glad that God brought us, brought our paths across each other, you know, and for me to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, my name is LaToya Matthews, and I am originally from Mississippi, born and raised in the country, um, the Mississippi Delta, and so I'm a country girl at heart. And so, you know, as you can tell by the accent, I don't even know if it's an accent. We have like our own language in Mississippi, so, <laughs> um, but I am currently in Georgia. I moved to North Atlanta in 2006 after I graduated college. And so I am here with my husband. This year we'll be married for 18 years and I have a daughter. She'll be 17 in June. And so keep the prayers coming because these teenagers, you know, just if you don't have a prayer life, a teenager will make you have one. Okay. And so... <laughs> And I am also incredibly blessed to have a bonus son who is 21. And so we are here in North Atlanta and I am a freedom coach and I help women who have 
especially women of faith who've experienced abortion to walk in love. And that is liberation, obedience, victory, and execution. Because love is an action word. And without execution, there is no ripple effect for others to get permission to do and be who God has created them to be. And so I just really want women to walk in love and to experience God's love because it's God's love that causes us to grow, to heal, and to be who we were created to be. And so that's a little bit about me. And first and foremost, before anything, I am a daughter of God. And so I love being a daughter and just knowing the role of a daughter. And so I am my father's daughter. So I can say that now. I'm a daddy's girl. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And Latoya, your journey has... I'm not going to say it's atypical. It's probably more typical than what most of us would think because there are so many Mm -hmm. people who go through struggles, traumas, and myriad experiences in their childhood that lead them to make decisions as they age. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's so beautiful to hear you say that, that you're a daddy's girl. Because in the book, you talk about the fact that your dad, your real dad, your biological dad was not always there for you. And it took years and years and years before you were able to have a relationship with him. And so Mm -hmm. I think many people struggle with this concept of God as our father, uh, as our daddy, really, because he is so incredibly loving and gracious because- of a relationship with an earthly father that was not stable and leads us to question like, okay, so he's a guy. Could he really be a good father? What does that mean? And I would love to have your perspective on that. Yes. Well, like you said, my dad wasn't really present in my life, but you know, our relationship has gotten um, better and he is around more now, but at the time it was, you know, if I didn't have that relationship with my dad and if my earthly dad didn't want me, then why would my heavenly father want me? And so that really took a toll. And I just really had to begin to pray and ask God to, you know, help me to see myself as he created me and to also allow me to know what a daughter is, because it is hard to know the role of a daughter if you've never had that in your life. And so I really had to sit down and really study God's word and look for scriptures that talked about being a daughter. And so in allowing God to really embrace me. And I know that it's it's hard for some people because it's like, how can you do that with someone that you've never seen before? Right. Like you just know of the name. But it's like I had to really come to a vulnerable place and really take that relationship with God and just really almost kind of have faith and pretend like he was here. And so in my times, I would sit and have to be vulnerable and allow myself to be naked before God and say, God, I really don't know what this is, but I would love for you, you know, to show me. And getting to know God, he also allowed people to come into my life that allowed me to know what unconditional love was. And so dealing with people who also gave unconditional love was, it helped me to understand that unconditional love with him. Mm -hmm. To have it in the flesh helped me to understand, you know, my heavenly father. And so I really had to pray and allow myself and give myself permission to be vulnerable and to say, I don't know what this is. But I need help in understanding that. Mm -hmm. And so and really just being able to take off the mask, being able to say, you know what, I may not get it right, but I'm human. That's inevitable. And I have a father who is willing to because the Bible said he corrects whom those whom he loved. Right. And so I had to understand that it's not based on what I do, but this love that he has for me, it is correcting, but it's also because he cares about me. Uh And so just being able to connect with people who was able to give me that genuine love helped me to understand the genuine love of my father. 
Hmm. That's so beautiful. And he uses people in our lives. Like, you know, I'm a firm believer in that, that, you know, when we're praying for something, it could be the answer could be spoken by a dear friend or just when we really need that connection, he gives us that through other people. So, Mm -hmm. okay. The title of your book is Unveiled Freedom. And that is related to, you chose that related to a scripture verse. Will you share that with us and why you chose that? Yes. Well, Unveiled Freedom is based on um, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And I'm going to read it here um, because it was just one of those moments. Um, But 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And I chose that scripture because there has always been a veil that has been over me to kind of hide who I am. And just like what Moses did in the Bible, when he came down from the mountain, there was a veil that he covered himself with so that the people couldn't see that the glory was diminishing, right? Because what it would probably cause a havoc among the people to see that the glory of the Lord was leaving. But for me, the word unveiled in the dictionary, it means to, it's almost kind of like exposing something new, something that you've never seen before to unveil something. And one of the definitions that I chose for unveil was the freedom to be seen. And so I wanted to remove the veil that became a barrier between me and God, between my inner world and my external world. And so Unveil Freedom is like now you get to hear and read some things about me that you never knew. Like you get to see this new person that is being transformed into the image of God because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. And so it's the spirit of the Lord who has really taken the veil from me to reveal me in all of my flaws and all of my weaknesses and all of the insecurities that I have or, you know, have had, you get to see that. And, and this is how I was created, but you also get to see that because I have these things, it can still be used for God's glory. Mm -hmm. And so despite of, what we've gone through, this unveiling is revealing the true nature of who I am and that allowing people to see God can still use me despite the things that I've gone through, despite my shortcomings, despite my flaws. And so it's like I get to you get to take the veil off so that others can truly see who you are and not be ashamed of that. And now, and this brings us to the word shame. And in the book, mm-hmm. you have an acronym Uh, for shame. And it's silent, hurtful, and misleading emotion. And I love that perspective because no matter what we've experienced that has led us to feel shame, that's exactly what it is. It's misleading emotion, but it is silent because we keep Mm -hmm. it inside. And you talk about in the book, and we talked about it just before we started recording about how when we hold in that shame and all of those negative emotions and those terrible thoughts that we have about ourselves and our unworthiness, it leads to sickness. Like we will Mm -hmm. start manifesting physical symptoms in our bodies because this is just destroying us from the inside out. And I would love for you to talk about that in regards to your journey. I mean, you mentioned before, like the shame didn't start after the abortion. The shame yeah. began very early in your life. And then that, you know, it was one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Yes. So in the book, in chapter one, I named it the Genesis, because just like you said, I had to realize that shame just didn't happen with my abortion. Shame was already there. My abortion just magnified it. And I call it the Genesis because 
sometimes we're not willing to go back to the very thing and find ourselves in this revolving door of going through the same patterns, the same emotions, because we're not willing to go to the genesis of where it all started from. And so my shame started in high school when um, I made the decision to sleep with a guy and the whole entire school found out about it. And I wasn't able to talk about it with anyone. So I kept that to myself. And so one of the questions I ask in a book, what is your genesis? Like, where did it start with you? Because now I realize that now I can go back to my genesis and now I'm able to confront that thing of where shame initially started and I can close the door on it now. I can come face to face with it, shut the door so that I'm not constantly going through this emotional roller coaster of and trying to figure out and piece out why I'm going through these same patterns. And so shame, you know, started then. But after I had my abortion, I had this pain in my stomach. And before I knew exactly where it came from, it would appear like a very sharp pain in my stomach. And it was almost as a reminder of what I had to deal with for the rest of my life. But it wasn't until my pastor introduced us to this book called The True Measure of a Woman by Lisa Bevere. And in there, it said, what is, she asked two questions at the end of chapter two, which talked about what is it that you have in your closet that you need to clean out? And what is it of value that you have to give to someone else? And we met again after reading the book and I told my pastor what I had done and told her, you know, that I had prayed every day that God would forgive me for what I had done. And she said, sweetie, God forgave you the very first time that she prayed. And she didn't know that I was having this pain in my stomach. But when she said, God forgave you the very first time that you prayed, I haven't had that pain in my stomach anymore because now I realize that it was me holding unforgiveness in my body that was showing up as this pain in my life, you know, almost as punishment for me. And I know that there's a book that ca that's called The Body Keeps Score. I haven't read it, but from my understanding, this is how, you know, the very thing of what you said, our body manifests these things because shame creates secrets, secrets create stress and stress creates sickness. And because I was storing all of this up in my body, I was holding that unforgiveness against myself of what I had done because it was like, what if I would have chose another uh, another route? What if someone would have been there for me to tell me to tell me this isn't the decision that you had to make? But I understand now that you know what it was my decision, but God knew that I was going to walk into that clinic and He still chose me to tell this story. So now, if I choose to tell this story. The Bible says that he will not put his people to shame. And so I had to trust that if God wanted me to tell this story, that he would not put me to shame. And so we have so much that we hold on inside. And as a woman, majority of the things that we hold on to is held in our womb. You know, the stress is held in our stomachs and, you know, it's the closest thing to our hearts, right? You know, along with our minds. And so it's like that connection there. And we really don't realize how in keeping those things internally is showing up in our lives. It's not probably just a headache that you have. It's probably shame of something that you've experienced or a traumatic experience that you um that has happened to you in your life is not just the arthritis i truly believe as scripture says that you know it says that envy rots the bones right so we probably need to check ourselves when we have issues with our bones and things like that because it may be envy so i do truly believe that as the bot as the bible says things show up in our lives because of the emotions that we're holding on to like anger it's associated with the heart it shows up, you know, in your heart with anger. And so, but the Bible also says that the word is medicine to our bodies. So if I'm taking the word as medicine, then I can, you know, begin to heal some of those areas in my life as I begin to say that scripture that says, search me, O Lord, know my heart, 
like expose every dark area in me so that nothing is hidden so I can deal with it. And I'm not trying to take on everything at one time, you know, as they say, eat the elephant one bite at a time is like cleaning my house. I can only clean one room at a time. So Lord, show me the room that I need to work on right now so that I can begin to heal and so that you can begin to mend those areas in my life. Mm, I love this so much, so much. And it's, Okay. So, I mean, I could say so much to that, but there's so much I want to cover, right? So in the book, you also said like the root of shame is confusion and disturbances. And mm -hmm. I would love for you to, to talk about that because we know that the only way to forgive ourselves is to accept the forgiveness that Christ offers us. And he mm -hmm. suffered immensely for us. And that yes. is how we, that is how God sees us as his righteous child. And mm -hmm. without that, we are unrighteous, but we yes. have been given that gift of righteousness through what Jesus did for us. And that mm -hmm. is where our clarity comes from. So I would love for you exactly. to talk about that, like the root of shame. And then how, when we have shame, we'll move into trying to be perfect or make everything else perfect. And we need mm -hmm. to see that imperfection because we are imperfect. See that imperfection as a blessing because that's where we can then strive for that living in that place of righteousness and love and hope and grace. So I would love for you to, yeah. to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I began, Holy Spirit was like study shame. And so I went to the strong concordance and in the strong concordance, there was one word that, you know, kept coming up, which was, um, which was the base of it was confusion because shame, if we, if we have shame in our lives, it does cause us confusion. And when I think about that word shame is always Adam and Eve that comes up when they were in the garden. Mm -hmm. And if the enemy can disrupt your peace and keep you in confusion, then you can't walk out your identity of who God created you to be and do the things that he's called you to do because there's such a, you're confused about your identity. You're confused about the things that need to take place in your life. And so if he can keep you in that place of confusion, you're not more than likely you're going to stay there. And wondering, and if it gets too hard, you're going to just stop and you're going to settle with that very thing that is happening in your life. So if he can keep us in confusion, then he has us right where he wants us, where we're not thinking about the word. We're thinking about how in the heck can I come up out of this? How can I be who God has called me to be when I have all of this going on in my life? And we see that in Genesis three with Adam and Eve and they were walking naked and unashamed in the garden. But when the serpent came and said, you know, you can eat this fruit, this fruit, right? And they they bit the fruit. And then there, it says that their eyes were open. And they went and hid from the Lord. And they put fig leaves over themselves. And it's almost like a scene of, for those who have children, when that little one does something wrong, they run off and hide because they think <laughs> something bad is about to happen. And that's what Adam and Eve did. And it was like it caused confusion for them because they were never meant to know that they were naked and unashamed. Like the garden was supposed to be a place of fellowship. It was supposed to be a place of joy and fellowship with the Lord because he created them in his image. And so when the serpent and sometimes is not just what people say that are serpents. It's the enemy, right? The the bits and pieces of me that experience the trauma that begin to talk to me, that becomes the serpent, you know, for me telling me lies of you're not worthy. And then we take those fig leaves. And as I put in the book, the fig leaves can be the degrees, the marriages, the children, the successes, the accolades, the things that you um, veil yourself with to become hidden in plain sight. But when the Lord came to look for Adam and Eve, he called out to them and they, and they responded and was like, we were hiding because we saw that we were naked. 
And the Lord was like, who told you that you were naked? You know, and instead of allowing them to continue to cover themselves in those fig leaves, God said, I got one better for you. I'm going to cover you in animal skin, leather. I'm going to give you the best of the best because what you tried to do on your own wasn't doing it. And so when we have that shame, when we are able to be vulnerable enough to say, God, this is what has happened. And God is like, now I can take that shame and cover the robe of shame and cover you with the robe of righteousness. And that can only happen when we bring those things and allow ourselves permission to be vulnerable with the Lord. And it's like, yeah, he already knows what you've done. But he's still waiting on you to come forth and say, you know what? I can't do this on my own. And now he can trade those things, you know, to give us the robe of righteousness. And so it's all about giving ourselves permission to be vulnerable, to allow and surrender the pain in the traumatic experiences that we've gone through and surrender it to him so that he can use it for his glory. Because he said, I can take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And how much more can he do, you know, for us once we realize that we are his sons and daughters. So now I no longer have to be confused about who I am when I know the one who protects me, when I know the one who can use my the my misery for a miracle. Right. Who can take the test and turn it into a testimony? Because after all, we're supposed to be walking epistles like we're supposed to be these open books so that. Our stories be the permission and the key to unlocking someone else's freedom. Mm -hmm. And I and I had a friend that said, um, at the end of the day, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not when I get to the gates of heaven, right? I want to hear it at night. <laughs> and furthermore, I don't want blood on my hands because I choose to stay in the position and place that is comfortable for me instead of doing the uncomfortable. Because everything is working out for my good, right? And there are other people and destinies that God has destined for us. But unless we release ourselves from the place of where we are, we would never know what's ahead for us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to that person, it's, it's just like, I know you may be in confusion now, but allow yourself the opportunity to give that to God to find out who you are so that you're not being stagnant in this place of where you've been your entire life. Mm -hmm. And before we start it, there's, there's two places I want to go. I want to ultimately get to your five pillars of freedom, but mm -hmm. before we do that, when we were talking beforehand, you, we were talking about, yes, your book is about the shame of abortion and overcoming that and healing from that. But we were talking about how shame comes in so many forms. And mm -hmm. when you say the term abortion, and I loved how you said it, because you said it very gracefully, and I'm going to probably not say it anywhere near as nicely as you did, but you, you spoke of how, you know, we abort other things in our lives mm -hmm. to cover yes. the shame or to try mm -hmm. to deal with the shame on our own. We're not yes. letting God in to do this for us. So I would love for you to speak to that a little bit, because I think there are probably a lot of us who have not had an abortion, but yet we have aborted other things in our lives, much to right. God's dismay, because we are not taking the action that he wants us to take to bring glory to his kingdom or to bring other people to him. Yes. Yes. And so for me, abortion birth purpose within me is oxymoron as that sound, my abortion birth purpose in me. But I always tell people, you may not have had a physical abortion, but you've had things in your life that have tried to abort your destiny, whether it be that divorce, whether it be the molestation, whether it be addiction or alcoholism, you've had something in your life that have tried to abort the plans that God has for you. And so you may not have had a physical one, but you've had other things in your life that have tried to keep you where you are, to keep you from fulfilling the destiny that God has for you. And no matter what that thing is, God can still use it for his glory. And so, yes, there are things that have happened 
but God can still use it to birth purpose. But are you willing to tell the story, the one that is covered in shame? Are you willing to still tell it to bring him glory of what he has done? Because I hear a lot of people say when they have abortions, particularly that they have to live with shame, guilt and regret for the rest of their lives. And I choose not to believe that. Because when I fully understand that Jesus took it on the cross over 2000 years ago, shame is not my cross that I have to bear any longer. The cross I now bear is telling this story so that other women can know that there is purpose on the other side, that you don't have to live in the torment or the turmoil day after day, night after night. Like there is freedom on the other side. Yes, it may look scary on the other side, but God has placed people who have gone through these experiences to create a space for you to get the healing that you need. And so shame, regret, and guilt is no longer mine to bear because it's already been bared on the cross. And I have so many women that reach out to me and say, you know, I watch YouTube videos, but it, st it still seems like these women are still dealing with some things. But when I see you, I see joy and that's what I want. And I've allowed myself that permission to have the peace that is spoken about in the Bible, to have that unspeakable joy. Because when I understand what has been done for me and when he said, you have been forgiven and I've thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness. If he's not holding it over my head, then why am I? And the same thing goes for the drugs, the alcohol, the divorce. If God isn't holding it over your head anymore, then why are you? Oh, such a powerful question. Such a powerful question. And it's one that every single person listening should reflect on. And that's one of the things I loved about your book is you ask these powerful questions at the end of each chapter. So we actually truly have to reflect on ourselves and what are we holding on to? Where are we disappointing him? Because we're not following his lead or accepting his grace, which truly should be so simple. Like he, mm -hmm. he serves it to us on a platter. He doesn't ask us to do mm -hmm. anything for it, but to repent. And that's, that's it. Yeah. Have and a it's repent sad. Of yeah. It's so sad to think how many people hold on to such awful things when they could just live like you with joy. Mm -hmm. You're right. Because now it's, I healed the wound of abortion, but now I'm still having to heal the side effects. So I've healed the wound. Now I'm healing the side effects of where there was insecurity where there was shame where there was um you know thinking that I wasn't worthy of God's blessing right and the picture that I have is like one who goes to physical therapy when you break a bone you don't immediately go to physical therapy you go to physical therapy after it, it is healed right and some of the side effects of that is having to you have weakened muscles and you have to build those back up. You have to probably, depending on the injury, learn how to walk again, right? And it's like the wound is healed, but now I heal from the side effects of what it has done in my life. And so it's like, now can I trust God with these things? And I have to know that I can trust God with me. I can trust God with my insecurities. I can trust God with my flaws. I can trust God with my pain. Because so many of us, like you said earlier, our relationships with God are based on relationships that we have with people. And when we don't feel safe with people, we don't feel safe with God. And we have to begin to heal that relationship with self and with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this it's, is where we come out of religion into relationship. Yeah. And that relationship it's what's, is what is so key. Because until mm -hmm. we have that relationship, we really are like the sheep that's lost. We're not listening yes. for his call to bring us home. Exactly. Yeah. But thank God he'll be the 99 for the one. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So let's talk real quick about the five pillars of freedom. And I know it's not something we can talk real quick about, but we can just do like a summary of 
the five pillars of, of freedom, I because I think they're so important. Yes. So the five pillars of freedom are what I consider the keys to living a life of transformation and liberation. And those five key, uh, those five pillars of freedom are power of peace, personal identity, pattern breaking, permission to dream and practicing healthy habits. And the power of peace, there's a reason why peace is one of the fruit of the spirits, right? Because it means wholeness. It means you know, having this place of not something that's temporary, but something permanent, you know, when you can look at a thing and not be moved by it because you have the peace that God is already taking care of it and personal identity, just truly embracing the authentic you, who you are at your core, not who everybody else says that you are, but who God says that you are. And through personal identity, we walk through the DNA process, which is DNA, the D stands for disrupt, dismantle, and destroy the labels that you accepted as true, those lies that you've accepted as true. The N is for naked, being able to get naked before the Lord. And it's like, we can get undressed and be naked in the shower, but we're not naked before God. We still wear this veil. We still wear these things that cover the most intimate parts of what he wants access to. And the A is acceptance. There are things that we reject that God has specifically placed on the inside of us. And we reject them not knowing that when we accept those things, we're able to truly walk in our authority. Acceptance equals authority. My family members used to say that I was very sensitive in a crybaby, right? I tried to reject those things. But now as I mature and heal, those are the necessary things that I need for the work that I'm called to do. It takes someone to be sensitive for the work and to have a, you know, a heart that has compassion. And then we have pattern breaking. What patterns in your life are holding you back from the life that you desire to live? What are those patterns that you have that have kept you in this place of going in cycles and circles? Permission to dream, allowing yourself to have that childlike faith and to dream again. As kids, we dream, but then as we become adults somewhere along the way, we're told that we're not able to dream anymore. But the Bible says it takes childlike faith. And faith is imagining, you know, having an imagination. When we become adults, we lose that imagination. So it's all about getting other people out of your head and truly going after the dream that God has placed in your heart. And practicing healthy habits, that is nurturing those healthy lifestyle, you know, changes that get you to the life that you've envisioned. And when, one thing about practicing healthy habits is I don't believe in the, for some things, I don't believe in the 21 day rule of where you do one thing for 21 days, it breaks the habit. It doesn't work like that because if I have perfected over the last seven years of talking negative to myself, I'm not going to be able to break that in 21 days. And so many people, if they don't see the results that they want after the 21 days, they give up and quit because in my mind, you told me I was able to do this in 21 days. Granted, if you have the willpower, you're able to do so, but 21 days doesn't just kick the habit of you know, the negative self-talk or, you know, the things that you've endured during your childhood. It may take six months. It may take a year. It may take two years. But giving yourself grace to, you know, go forth and continue to move forward within, you know, to move forward in who you are. And so those are the five pillars of freedom that I truly believe are the keys that get you to true transformation and liberation in your life. Mm, and I love them and they're so spot on. And that, what I love so much about your book and the emphasis on shame is that it, it's very similar to what I talk about in my book. I have a whole chapter on shame and we really do have to take action every single day. It's not one and done. It's not 21 and done. It is literally mm -hmm. day after day after day. And even after we're healed, we could still have triggers or be exposed to yeah. a situation that makes us revert back. So we have to stay. What's the, there's a Bible verse about being on guard and we have mm -hmm. to be aware. It's almost like our head has to be on this, on a swivel for the enemy because he's going to throw us 
these gut punches, right? right. Where, mm -hmm. and especially the closer we get to the Lord and the more we heal and we have a deeper relationship to him, the more he's going to throw things at us to try to distract mm -hmm. us and pull us away. So I love okay. the emphasis on, you know, in healthy habits that that could be journaling. It could be being in God's word. Mm -hmm. It should be actually being in God's yeah. word every single day. Cause if we aren't close to his word, then we're going to more easily succumb to the temptations to mm -hmm. revert back to negative patterns. Exactly. Exactly. Because that Bible scripture says, you know, to be sober minded because the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right. And that word devour means to swallow up, to drown. The enemy wants to drown you. He wants to um, swallow you up, you know, to make sure that you don't get to your destiny. And so we have to be sober minded. We have to be alert because he can use the smallest things and take the smallest crevice to sneak in and try to disrupt every part of your life. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you know, we have to every day put on that full armor of God because I can't, I can't expect abs if I'm just going to the gym one day a week and I'm not eating correctly. Like there's multiple things that you have to do to get abs, right? And it's just not going to the gym. Your diet also has to be in line for you to get abs. And so what makes us think that this journey is just a one and done thing? Every day we have to put on the full armor. Every day we have to condition ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know. So powerful. Sometimes we, it's just like so foolish to think that we're just going to, you know, skate on by some things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our human nature, right? We, we do tend to be, yeah. to be foolish. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so much more for us that we can't understand because we can't see it. And we have mm -hmm. to go into it with faith and faith, you know, it's really, it's believing in something that is not seen, but it's mm -hmm. truly just giving ourselves to that. And it's mm -hmm. the transformation that we can experience is truly powerful. All right, yes. Latoya, we need to wrap up. This has been amazing. And just, I could just listen to you, your every word, just I can, for hours and hours, you're just so graceful. And I just, I love, love, love that you're helping so many people overcome tragedies, traumas, awful situations and circumstances so that they don't have to live that way, not liking yes. themselves and really trusting mm -hmm. in God and who he is bringing them to be. Exactly. Yes. And it is, it's, it's work, you know, and we know that, and you know, this, you know, the hard work is hard work. And so, you know, it's, it's hard work, but it's so necessary and so fulfilling and so worth it. You know, what would happen if you gave yourself permission to see what's on the other side of your healing and, and, and live life while you heal. They're not exclusive. Like I don't have to put off my life you know, to heal, you know, to do a thing, right? Like I can write the book and heal at the same time. Like I can live my life and heal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just, God just has so much more, you know, for us. And every day I'm just learning something new, of, you know, about his nature and character. And it's just like, oh my gosh, like, you know, like it, it took a lot to get here, but it's so, so worth it. You know, the one that we could talk for hours and I may just have to have you back because I think something that is in the book that you mentioned, and we're not going to talk about it today, but when, and I, I think a lot of times, I, I, I don't know that this is factual, but I think a lot of times women will have an abortion, but the, the man may not even know that there was a pregnancy mm -hmm. or know that there was an abortion. But when mm -hmm. they do know, they often have the same experience emotionally as a woman. And you talk about this with your husband in the book because he was, before he was your husband, this happened. And um, I just, I guess I'm bringing that to the table because I think as women, 
we are nurturers, we are caretakers. And, but sometimes when it comes to our husbands, we kind of forget that they have emotions too, and they experience things that maybe we don't know or understand. And we just assume because they're the man, they're going to get through it. Um, right. And, and oftentimes we, and, and I, I'm not saying we all do this, but I think periodically it happens, you know, we're busy taking care of everything else and the kids and the the mm-hmm. job and the, uh, this and then that and the other. And we often overlook that. And I love that your book addressed that too, that he had to heal at the same time mm-hmm. you had to heal. It wasn't just yeah. you in order right. for your relationship to continue to grow and be strong. And I think that's just a beautiful thing that you were able to heal together. I mean, you healed, you know, you were working on your healing right. and then he joined you in that healing process. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's so, so beautiful. But um, listeners, I do want to encourage you to read the book because no matter where you are on your life journey, it's going to inspire you. And it's called Unveiled Freedom. I will put the link in the show notes so that you can easily access it. Very, very um, hesitantly, I'm going to offer my book to a listener who leaves a rating or review because, and you get the book with my underlines and my notes because, hey. I only underline and make notes on the very important things. So anyway, but I would love to share that with one listener who leaves a rating and review for us. So we will do a little drawing out of a hat and I will mail the book to you and I will mail it to you with the bookmark that Latoya had in the book. So you'll get the whole thing, um, but leave us a rating and review. And when you do tag Latoya and I on social media, on Instagram, and just share a screenshot of your review. And then we will draw a name and I will send you a copy of the book. Um, I love Well, let's do two. Let's do two. Let's do two, two books. books. Okay. Let's do two books. Two reviews right. for two. Books. And I will send a signed copy to another listener who leaves a review and tags us with that um, review. So we're going to make it a two. Let's make it. All right. There you go, listeners. So that's your, that is your inspiration to get out there and leave us a rating and review. And as you know, I say it all the time. I appreciate you so much for being here, especially those who stayed till the end, because I know it was a long episode, but the, the value, the meaningfulness, the impactfulness of everything Latoya said is just so to me, inspiring and powerful. So I love you all. I thank you for being here. LaToya, how can the listeners connect with you and learn more from you? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at the T-H-E LaToya L-A-T-O-Y-A M-A-T-H-E-W-S just one T in Matthews and you can also um, connect with me on my website LaToyaMatthews.com Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for all the incredible work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Listeners, you know the drill. If you know someone who has experienced abortion or someone who has experienced any trauma or is living with shame, please share this episode with them. Together we can create that ripple effect of good and let's change lives. Let's bring more people to Christ and let them experience his grace, his love, his mercy, his hope. All right, I'll see y'all next time.